Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Burgess. Great to have you along for today's podcast. And also great to have our guest today. Laurie Andrus is the director of the Office of Public Health Practice, Workforce Development, and an assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy, Management, and Leadership at the West Virginia University School of Public Health. And Cindy Fitch is an extension professor and associate dean of programming and research at West Virginia State University Extension Service. We're going to talk about an article that they wrote for the Journal of Extension that appeared in the June uh, 2016 issue called Rural Health Inequities Mm -hmm. and the Role of Cooperative Extension. Uh, Lori, Cindy, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bob. And I just want to make a correction. At this time, I am an assistant professor in health policy at the School of Public Health. Thanks for that uh, clarification. I'm not, I'm not the best I'm at... with West Virginia University, not West Virginia State Oh, University. I'm sorry. sorry. Well, I'm so used to the state <laughs> university thing with the land-grant university. <laughs> right. It just, just comes out. So I appreciate the corrections, um, and uh, sorry for the, for the okay. errors there. Um, so this idea of rural health inequities, uh, it might be new to some of our listeners. Uh, it was definitely new to me when I read your article. Um, so, Lori, can you explain health inequities and what are some of those inequities we have uh, that we deal with in the United States? Sure. So, health inequities are basically differences between groups based on their social status. And so, when we look in the United States and we think about the way groups are arranged based on social status, that can either be based on income levels gender, um, or racial and ethnic differences. And so when you start looking at how people are um, arranged into groups and how we name them and put them into groups, that would explain health inequities among those groups. So how does the um, sort of categorization into a certain group affect inequities? I mean, are, are there certain things that affect people by those classifications, by gender, by race? So when you look in any different region, and you can start in the United States, you can go down to the local level, within states, um, and then you can also look at countries. But when you begin to think about how we form groups in any given region, and then we think about the distribution of resources based on group status or social status, then you begin to get health and social inequities. So I like to use a a model where you start at the top with regional policies, rules, regulations, systems, and institutions. And then those systems and institutions determine the policies and the rules and the regulations. And then if you go down in thinking about a pyramid and you arrange your groups based on social status, then that is also going to determine how resources are distributed to those groups. Because some groups get more of one thing and some groups get less of one thing. And we start parsing out resources based on social status, then the result would be inequities, social or health inequities. So you mentioned in your article, Laurie, about social determinants of health. What, what are those and how do they relate to this idea of inequities? There are a lot of um, different ways that we describe social determinants of health. And one thing you'll find if you begin to really look at social determinants of health is that it, it's also based, again, on the country that you're in or the region So in the United States, we have a particular way of thinking about the social determinants of health that's different from, say, the Canadians or Europeans. Um, But one of the simplest ways to think about the social determinants of health is to consider how we practice medicine in the United States. And so when you're, you're thinking about how we train physicians and nurses, we train them to think about the body. And so they look internally at an individual and their body to determine their health. But as we move forward in our thinking, and this is only in the last 10 to 15 years in the United States, we begin to put the body in a context. People live in a place, they live in a neighborhood, they live in a community. There is a region that surrounds 
that body and that person. That person has a group affiliation. They live in a neighborhood. They live in a city. They live in a state. They belong to a group. And therefore, the social determinants of health are all of those things that make up where that person is located contextually or based, again, on social status. So social determinants of health are not just about the body and the individual, but it's about where people live, work, and play. And so then we're talking about um, affordable housing, transportation that's available, wages and employment, different kinds of jobs, um, their access to an educational system. So those make up the context, and that is what we call the social determinants of health. The article mentioned, you know, it's titled Rural Health Inequities. Um, and, it, and I think in the article, I think you use an example of type 2 diabetes, and I think it, you know, helps illustrate this a little bit. But um, maybe bringing in some of that, Lori, Lori uh, what are the uh, health inequities, you know, that are affecting rural areas particularly? I'll start with the, the one that, that we've been looking at for quite some time, and that is related to access to high-quality, affordable food. And in rural areas, that is a particularly um, vexing problem. And so one of the issues is the fact that people don't have access to high-quality, affordable food in rural areas because of um, topology, geography, um, and then also because of um, community economic development is issues with regard to developers building grocery stores in certain areas. And so people have to travel long distances for food. If you don't have transportation or you are elderly or you are a child and you have to depend on someone else to get you, to those locations where food may be found, and that is also an issue. If you are low income and you lack transportation, and let's say your age becomes a factor, then you belong in a group that cannot access healthy, quality, affordable food because you can't get to it because of the distance and all of those other factors. Um, Cindy knows quite a bit in the extension service about access to food in West Virginia. Can you talk about that a little bit, Cindy? How does, uh, how are you seeing that uh, in your state? Yeah, that's, um, that is a good question. Um, so it's as simple as someone waiting for transportation. A colleague had an example not too long ago of a, a person who was waiting outside of a grocery store with a load of groceries and a toddler and waiting for an hour for a taxi that never came. So if you have to um, wait for someone to give you a ride to a grocery store where food is available and um, wait for someone to pick you up, it really uh, affects how much you can buy or what you can buy or what you can get home and what you can transport. Um, West Virginia is a mountainous state for, for those of you who don't know our beautiful mountains. And so just because as the crow flies, it might be a short distance to, mm -hmm. to a market or a grocery store, doesn't mean you can get there easily on ground transportation. So there are a lot of things that contribute to um, poor food access or or barriers to food access in the state. And One other thing. Oh, go ahead, Lori. I was going to say, and then with regard to diabetes, if you if you throw type two diabetes into that description that we just gave you, so then you're talking about someone who has to um, measure their blood sugar level. So they have to have access to a glucometer, and they have to have access to the materials that go with the glucometer. So if you're low income and you can't afford those material strips that go in the glucometer to measure your blood sugar level, and that tells you when to take your insulin. So you've got a problem not only accessing food, but you can't access the materials that you need to care for yourself 
um, once you have type 2 diabetes. So in the preventive stages, we're talking about access to high-quality, affordable food, which is very difficult. And once you fall into the category of having type 2 diabetes, if you have problems accessing what you need to care for yourself, then the type 2 diabetes escalates. And so in the state of West Virginia or in other rural states, this is not just an individual problem. So we're not just counting the man who lives down the street or you know, the family that lives over the next county. This is a group problem based on social status from living in a rural environment. Another great illustration of that I thought from your article is, you know, just talking about um, obesity and, and and even type 2 diabetes, I suppose, would be affected by this is just access to um, places where you can be physically active. Yeah. Sidewalk infrastructure, things like that. Sure. That, that's a huge issue in West Virginia. We did a project where we um, talked with women who are enrolled in the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, the WIC program. And so we were talking to those women about how they access food and engage in physical activity. And so you would think that in a state like West Virginia, there is access to um, places for physical activity. And there is access for people who want to um, go hiking, um, and they're able to get to the place where they can hike or if they want to run and they can get to the, the river trail and run. But when we're talking about just the average everyday person or women enrolled in the WIC program, um, those people don't have access to safe places for physical activity. For physical activity. So they don't have sidewalks around where they live that are safe for them to walk on. If they have to walk to the grocery store, it's very difficult. The sidewalks are not complete. The sidewalks are bumpy or broken in places. So if they have a stroller with a child, they, they can't push that stroller down the sidewalk. So accessing food and having safe places for physical activity is difficult. Oftentimes you see people walking on the side road, on the side of the shoulders of a highway. Um, trying to get to a grocery store, which is very unsafe. So, Cindy, uh, you know, I guess what the thesis or one of the the themes of your article is that extension is, you know, uniquely positioned to help address some of these health inequities in rural areas. Why do you see extension as as positioned in that way? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I feel like we've talked a lot about problems and barriers, and um, we can talk about some of the solutions or some ways to address this. Extension is, um, I think, uniquely positioned. We are fortunate in West Virginia to still have an office in every county in the state, and many states do as well, and a, a county agent in one or more disciplines in every, um, every office. Uh, we have, Extension has a broad base of disciplines to address a lot of different issues that, uh, that affect those social determinants of health. You know, we have our agriculture, uh, natural resources, which is related to food production, food access. Um, it's also part of economic development. We have um, my discipline, family and consumer sciences. We've long had an interest in health and uh, healthy, nutritious foods and food safety and food resource management. We have community resource development or community development who can address those, um, those social determinants of health related to policies, related to environment, access and to economic development and job readiness. And we have 4-H, um, largest youth serving organization. And um, they can help, help those kids in a lot of ways. They can help with school readiness and college readiness and um, workforce development. They have a focus on the help H that, um, that helps to promote the individual's health. Um, we're part of a national network 
so we have access to expertise across the country. We have, we're a part of the land-grant university, so we have access to the resources of the land-grant university. We can truly extend those resources into the community. And we have um, a long history of trusted local expertise. So our agents are a part of the community, embedded in the community. They know how to build coalitions. They know how to facilitate meetings and facilitate change and group activities. There's just a lot of resources that are a part of the extension service nationally and locally to address these social determinants of health. So, I, I mean, I agree. I guess <laughs> how am I trying to say this? I mean, I think I think, and you know, our our audience is largely extension professionals. I think everybody uh, preaching to the so, choir. Well, I I think we see what you, I think what you're seeing. You're saying. I'm just wondering if um, how does that work functionally? Because I think that all of those things are true in in my state of North Dakota, um, but I struggle to think of examples where extension is leveraging all of those capabilities, all of that capacity to address yeah. health? Um, and that's a good question. So you may be familiar with the recently released, last couple of years, National Framework for Health Extension. Um, so the, the theory is, uh, or the principle is that what the cooperative extension system did for American agriculture when it was brand new in the early 20th century, we can do for healthcare. So this idea that having um, these experts, trained experts out in the field to, um, to, to look at practices, to do education, but also to look at policies and procedures um, and, you know, if you know extension history, you know, we, it actually started with the kids. Like sometimes you couldn't quite reach the farmers with new agricultural practices, so you reach the kids with the corn clubs and the tomato clubs. Um, so, that it, so it's part of our history, part of our DNA, that, um, that we had the capability of being change agents. So now it's a matter of focusing those capabilities and that capacity on these health issues that are affecting our, um, our country in such an adverse way. And, and this is an excellent time to do it because we have the interest of uh, the cooperative extension system as a whole and the extension committee on policy. So, um, so it's, it's time. Um, it's where the tipping point. So, Bob, I've, I found your question interesting, and you wanted to think about how extension focuses on health issues. And, and so one thing I would say is that you need to think about how you're defining health. Um, and so when we think about health inequities or health equity and the social determinants of health, we are thinking about those broader issues. And that makes extension a perfect vehicle for addressing the social determinants of health because it isn't just looking at the health as it's traditionally defined, but it's looking at all of those broader contextual factors that compose health. So if you think about the factors that make up health, we now say in the United States, and we've been saying this probably for about 10 years now, um, health care is only about 25 to 30% of what determines our health status. Um, there's also the social and economic factors, and then there's behavior. And in our models, we know that our social and economic fac factors control our behavior. So behavior doesn't just spring forth from groups or from individuals, it is shaped by contextual social and economic forces. And when you think about what extension does, it shapes those social and economic factors, which can then begin to shape the behavior of groups and families, communities, and individuals. 
So that's how extension relates to health status in our rural regions of this country. I want to pick up on something that you said there, Laurie, because it reminded me of, uh, of another part of your article and in this idea that, um, I, like I said, I agree extension might be positioned very well to, and I think Cindy's explanation is really compelling in, in that argument. Um, but um, uh, as we're currently approaching or health education, the ways in which we're currently approaching health education, you know, are we, uh, are those making a difference in this, in this sphere? And you, and I think in the article you get, you bring up um, sort of how programming is uh, developed for a wide audience, maybe without uh, Mm -hmm. any uh, attention paid to which group you are talking to. And that, that we try and get people to change their behavior through information and knowledge transfer um, and maybe not thinking about the fact that someone who is, uh, you know, on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum is like, you know, I can't do that. I can't go to the gym. I can't go walking because of my sidewalks. And, and are we delivering programming that is aware of that? Am I, maybe I'm, I don't want to be twisting what you guys said, but I, I think that that was the message that I was getting in part of that. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that what you said is spot on, but it is also one part of this big puzzle that we're trying to solve. And I want to be careful how I say this, um, because it's taking me a while to arrive at this um, metaphor, this model, this picture. Um, so health education is important, and we know that. We don't want to discount the health education aspect of what we do to make people healthier. Um, But again, it is only one aspect. And so we have that um, equity action spectrum in the article. So health health education is down at the lower end of the equity action spectrum. We're trying to move to the right on that spectrum. So when we do health education, it's about teaching people how to care for themselves. Um, but that doesn't always work. We know after 40 years in this country as public health people that health education is not enough for a variety of reasons. Number one, it doesn't begin to um, attack that context that shapes people's behavior. So you can't just teach people something and then set them back down in the same context and expect them to be able to actualize it. So you have to change the context. Um, Another issue with health education has to do with people's um, time, attention, and resources. Um, And this is kind of the free market argument. Um, Do people have enough time to absorb that information, to leisurely, you know, say, I'm going to read a book or I'm going to read this magazine about my health? Um, Do people have time to do that? Do they have access to all of that information? And thirdly, can they understand that information? And so then we're talking about their um, reading level, their educational level. Can they absorb the information that we're giving from a health campaign or from a health education um, standpoint? So health education is great, but it is not enough. And we know that after 40 years of doing health education campaigns in the United States. And one other thing I'd like to add to what Lori said is that cultural competence matters. So, um, again, using the example of diabetes education or nutrition education, uh, we teach diabetes education, self-management education in West Virginia differently from the way it's taught in New Mexico. Um, We have a different culture. uh, Appalachian culture is different from the Southwestern culture. So um, culture matters as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cindy, I want to ask about um, sort of the other stuff there, but beyond health education, the context, you know, what what you guys talk about as the sort of upstream efforts in that uh, equity action spectrum. Um, From your view, is cooperative extension uh, 
you know, and I suppose you can only speak to your experience in your system, comfortable addressing those kinds of contextual issues? Not yet. <laughs> I think that we're getting there and we're being pushed by outside forces. Um, FNEP, the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program's long history um, as a part of our, our Cooperative Extension, our Smith Lever. And, um, and in FNEP, we look at the socio-ecological model, the individual and family and community and policies and procedures. And we're being pushed more and more to look outside of that individual and family into the policies and procedures but it is hard for us. You know, we're um, government employees, state or federal employees. We can't uh, lobby. We can educate, but we can't lobby um, our policy makers. So, um, so we do walk a fine line. Yeah, and it seems like, um, although this maybe isn't a highly politicized issue, there there are some politics involved in some different ways when we talk about food access and we talk yeah. about, um, so, you know, so extension might be a little bit uncomfortable positioning itself on something that might be seen as a, sure. a one political side or the other. Well, because our funding comes from local bodies. Right. I, I think that, um, that is a very interesting question and it's one that we've had to confront in public health as well. Um, oftentimes people in public health work for government agencies. And so we realized a long time ago that some of this new era of health equity was going to require us to engage with decision makers. And so we've come up with some new tools in order to do that, and we have dusted off some old tools. Um, most nonprofits and other institutions understand the power of information and awareness. And so every time we do a study, every time we publish a paper, um, the question is, can we translate that information into something that is a useful tool for decision makers? And I think that that's something that we do very well. I, I think Extension does it very well. Um, and so communicating with decision makers and how we take our information and transform it is key we are stepping boldly into a new arena where we're going to try to bring awareness to certain kinds of public policies that are impacting the social and health equity of groups. And so thinking carefully about how we transform our information, package it, and who we present it to, and how we present it is very important. And I think we are stepping up to that um, goal. Um, long time listeners are probably going to uh, recognize my bias here in this, in this question, but um, at, as I read your article, as we're having this conversation, I can't help but think about uh, some of the food systems networks that exist in Minnesota. There's an Appalachian food systems uh, network. Um, Lori is part of the solution potentially, or, or part of the way that extension can really have an impact in this area is working within and with those networks uh, where that might contain public health uh, organizations and, and not-for-profits and maybe some people who can more directly uh, lobby or address policy? Yes, I think the answer to your question is yes, but I'm going to give you a, a broader um, formula or model to think about health equity. If you're tackling an issue that's related to social or health equity. If you only have one group at the table trying to work on that issue, then you know you're, you don't have a winning formula. You've got to have representation from multiple sectors in most cases because these problems are very sticky. Um, they overlap and cross over into other areas that may not be in your wheelhouse, so to speak. So when we're thinking about food access, we need the economic development people. We need banking institutions. We may need developers. We definitely need the, the farmers and the food industry. Um, and so projects that cross over between public health and extension and other groups that are into the production of 
food sources, they've got to be multi-sectored. Um, so, so just a simple idea. If it's just us and I'm looking around the room and I know everybody and we're all from the same group, you know, we're not going to have an adequate team to tackle this problem. I would add one other thing and Ed, it, you're absolutely right, Bob. We, it's great to work with systems within existing organizations and um, infrastructure that's already established. But it's important to, um, to make sure the priorities are shared because different organizations may have different priorities than, um, than what we're trying to accomplish. So that's, that's a, just a potential um, area for problems. Well, Lori Andrus and Cindy Fitch, I want to thank you very much. Uh, Lori Andrus from the uh, West Virginia University School of Public Health and Cindy Fitch from West Virginia University Extension Service. Their article is Rural Health Inequities and the Role of Cooperative Extension. You can find it in the Journal of Extension at joe.org. Thanks for joining us for the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Uh, hit us up on Twitter. Love to have you part of that community. It's at WDNEXT. We're on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently. Show notes for today's show and all shows are at bobbirch.com. Our theme music is Noon's Acid by And Nobody Cared. We use it under a Creative Commons license and you can find it uh, and more music by And Nobody Cared on Gemendo, gemendo.com. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon.